everyone, I'm Abiel, this is Sippy, and welcome to another Two Kids interview. Today we are joined by the Newberry Medal winning author, Matt D. La Pena. Some of Mr. De La Pena's books include the young adult books, Mexican White Boy, The Living, The Hunted, and Superman Dawnbreaker. Some of his picture books include Love, Milo Imagines the World, The Perfect Place, and, of course, Meet Me at Mar on Market Street. He also has a new picture book coming out in 2025 of March, Home. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. You've been a part of a couple middle grade anthologies with some of the very best middle grade authors. You also wrote two of the eight books in the middle grade series, Infinity Ring. So we know you can write for middle graders. But every time you write a book that's completely original, you write it for either little kids or young adults. So are you wondering why that's the case or? Um, yeah, why not us? Yeah, okay. So this is such a, I'm so glad that you asked that question first because I've spent the past two years writing my very first independent original middle grade novel and it was so much fun. And I think it comes out in 2025 at the end of the year. Um, not exactly sure what day it comes out, but so that's coming. Um, and it will be with Random House, uh, the same publisher that does my young adult novels. And it was so much fun to do middle grade. So I'm very excited about that coming out. Does it have a title yet? It does not. You know what? I have like 70 titles, but we haven't decided which one it will be. It's very hard to choose. It's such a big decision. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. What's it about? Okay, so um, I grew up a huge basketball person, you know, that was my that was my life when I was a kid. Um, and it's the way I got to college. So the main character is a really good basketball player, and he has to make a decision whether or not he wants to go live in a community away from his family, where he would have the most opportunities for exposure as a basketball player to like great college coaches or if he wants to not worry about his ambition and just live at home. So he has this opportunity to go somewhere else and he has to decide what he's gonna do. I'd read that. Oh, I appreciate it. Some of your picture books seem to be written as a message to parents as well as kids. Is that intentional? Well, it's that's a really good question. I have to tell you, honestly, I hope my picture books don't feel like a message because I feel like if you're going to tell the story the best it can be told, you have to leave any message behind and you have to just follow the characters and make the best story. However, most writers have something that they're interested in um, with each story. And that is very important to them. So for me, you know, a book like Last Up on Market Street, it's it's really me exploring what does it mean to live in a family where it's not just a traditional two-parent household. My character lives with his grandmother. Um, he also, he, he volunteers his time um, every Sunday after church. And so I'm exploring what does it mean to have these selfish desires, like you want to do this, you want to go play here, you'd rather not go to the homeless shelter to, to pass out food. But um, he has a grandmother who's telling him how to see the world as beautiful. Um, and so that's me exploring that territory, but I hope the message isn't so loud that it's more important than the story. Because to me... At the end of the day, the characters and the story are the most important thing. You've worked with a lot of different illustrators. Can you tell us about how that works? And have you ever had a drawing in one of your books that made you discover something and go back and change any of the text? Wow. That's happened to me once. I was working uh, with an illustrator named Lauren Long uh, on a book called Love. 
And uh, he's actually the illustrator of my new book coming in uh, early 2025 called Home that you mentioned. But he and I usually have long conversations about the text, just the words. And we discuss, you know, what they might mean, where they came from for me as the writer. And then he has to figure out what pictures to put next to the words. And here's something interesting. The best illustrators, they don't just illustrate the words exactly. They tell a, a second story that sits next to the, to the words. So what I love about picture books is you almost have two stories kind of going back and forth, weaving in and out of each other through the whole thing. So it's there's a lot of depth because of that. Well, one time in love, he showed me a sketch where I think the original text, if I can remember, is, and in time you learn to recognize a love overlooked, a love that wakes at dawn and rides to work on the bus, a pair of old house slippers that fit like love. Well, his sketch, he had a, a brother, an older brother come in and he was giving food to his little brother before he went to school. And I loved what he was doing so much that I took out that line about the house slippers and I changed it to a slice of burned toast that tastes like love because the older brother was giving him toast. So yes, sometimes, it's not very common, but sometimes an illustrator's picture makes me want to change the words. There's more representation in books now than there ever has been. Your books have been a part of that important trend. Is that something that has been important to you? Yeah, you know, I think the world is full of interesting people who are like us and different from us. And I hope my books are just like the real world, right? They're they're going to be, uh, you're going to meet characters who are similar to you, but hopefully you're also going to meet characters who are different from you. One of the reasons I think reading is the ultimate form of empathy is because you get to sit next to a character and watch how they live and how they see the world and interact with different people. And guess what? If that person's different from you, you get to know them while you're sitting in your house or your classroom. So I love that. Um, I want to always populate my books with diversity. Now, obviously, when we think about diversity, we think of different races, right? But it actually goes so far beyond that. It's also people who are growing up in different parts of the country. Like some people are in cities. Some people are in on farms. Um, some people believe one thing politically and they're going to vote for this person. I think they should be in the book. But I also think people who believe the opposite should be in that same book. So diversity goes so far beyond race. In a picture book, how hard is it to get everything you want to say in it with so few words? Uh, that is an amazing question because you just hit the hardest part of writing a picture book. You don't get that many pages. When I write a novel, I can write 300 pages, right? And every page could be full of words. When I write a picture book, usually it's just a sentence or two on each page and you only get like 40 pages. So you have to be precise. Um, so you have to cover a lot of ground, but you also want to tell a story that isn't so big, right? You want to find, see if this makes sense to you. At the end of a novel, I hope the character has changed a lot. You know, I think that's important, right? For a character to undergo change in the course of a novel. Well, in a picture book, I want the character to change too, but I, I see the change as like this little sliver of change. It's a little movement. Um, to me, that's enough for a picture book. But the last thing I'll say is this. It takes me as long to write a picture book as it does a novel for one reason, because every single word counts. You can't get even one word wrong, or at least wrong in your estimation, um, or it won't sound right. You know what I mean? So I have to get the story right, but I have to get the music of the words right, too. And that's what takes so long. Writing a book is a big commitment. So when you come up with an idea, how do you become sure that this is a story you want to tell? Oh, well, that's a good question. So, by the way, these are good questions. What's going on over there? You guys are having thinking some big thoughts over there. Um, so I think I always have new ideas. Even when I'm writing a book, and I know I'm going to be writing this book for six more months, I still get ideas all the time. So sometimes I get a really cool idea, and I, I get excited about it. But I know I have to finish the book I'm working on. 
So I will take a note on my computer and I'll spend one day just saying, hey, this story could be about this and this could happen and these characters are in the book. I can't write it now. Now I have to get back to the book I'm working on. But when I'm finished with it, I usually have like six or seven new ideas. And then I read through them and I figure out which one I'm most excited about. And then once you start writing it, it doesn't happen that every single time you pick the right one. You might get into it a couple months and realize, oh, no, I don't think this story is quite strong enough to hold an entire novel. I'm going to have to, like, put this aside and start on one of the other five ideas. So, you know, sometimes you don't pick the right one. But most of the time, if you're excited about it, it's probably going to end up working. When you are part of an, an anology, like Hope Wins and Flying Lessons and other stories, do you have any interaction with the other authors or do you just do your part with the, ed with the editor? Mostly you do your part separately from the other authors. However, especially in Flying Lessons, I'm friends with most of the other authors. So sometimes we'll talk about the story we're writing or we'll talk about, you know, like the ending. I don't know if it's working and one of us will read each other's ending. So I'm friends with a lot of different authors and we end up communicating. But in theory, each author is writing separately and they're turning it into the editor and trying to make it the best individual story. And then the editor's job is to pull them all together and make a, an anthology. What's being challenged and banned is happening in many places. You were a part of with other amazing writers. You can't say that, which talks about censorship and free expression. Why was it important to you to be a part of that book? Yeah, good question. I just think when I was young and I was a new author, I don't think I fully understood what getting a book banned meant. I thought this is a good thing, you know, it brings attention to your work. But then if you have this happen to you where a book is pulled out of a certain demographic's hands or somebody says that this book is inappropriate for for whatever reason, you know, you realize that the people you are most writing for, they might not get to see the story that you're kind of writing for them. Um so it's keeping important stories out of the hands of people who might need them most. So that's the disappointing thing when it comes to censorship. And my opinion is I have two young kids. Are you guys, what are you guys like 26 and 27 or how old are you guys? <laughs> I'm uh, just kidding. I, I'm 11. She's 10. Okay. So my daughter is 10. And you know what I realize? If she is not ready for a book, she either will put it down because it, she's just not ready for that yet, or she'll read it and she'll concentrate on a different part of the story that's not the mature part because she's not ready to think about that, right? So I believe kids know what they should be reading at what times. I feel like young people figure out you know, where their interest should be. Um, and by the way, if somebody is curious about something that a, the adult world says is controversial, they might read about it just so they can understand a little bit about it. As they get older, it won't be so surprising when they hear about it again. I think reading is such a safe place to be exposed to new um, and sometimes scary ideas. Um, so for me, I, I just ideally, I wish there wasn't so much book banning happening right now. Um, I think sometimes what happens is books they get caught up in a conversation they're, they they have no purpose being caught up in, like politics. People are just trying to tell a good story, and there's an audience out there that might want to read that story. And we adults, we sometimes get in the way of that. And that's what, to me, censorship really is. You wrote a Superman book, Dawn Breaker. Is there extra pressure when writing a book for an iconic character like Superman? There is a lot of pressure because so many people have told Superman stories before and you don't want to mess it up. You know what I mean? Also, when you write a superhero like that, you have two editors. You have your book editor and then you have, in my case, I had DC Comics, an editor from, from that company. 
and they were both reading the manuscript. And here's the problem. Sometimes one of them would say, I really like this part on page 32. And then the other one would say, this part on page 32, we have to change. So I got different messages from both editors and it was confusing. So that book was a hard process. I'm happy it's done now and I'm proud of the story, but it was a challenge. You talked about a number of pages in, in, in a picture book. Most Newberry Meadow books are between 250 and 400 pages. Amy on Market Street has 32 pages. Can you tell us exactly where you were and your reaction when you figured out you won the Newberry Medal? Sure. Well, first of all, you make a great point. Most of the time, a Newberry Medal is for a middle grade novel, right? And these are longer books. That's why I never had any inclination that I would write a book that could win the Newbery because I wrote young adult novels, which are not eligible for the Newbery, And I wrote picture books, which I thought were not eligible for the Newbery. Um, And by the way, you know what somebody told me? They once told me, your acceptance speech for the Newbery was longer than the book that won the Newbery, which is kind of funny, right? Um, I was in Minneapolis. I was doing some teaching there and I got a call at like three in the morning and they said, last stop, uh, we, we're awarding you the Newberry Medal for last stop on Market Street. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. And then I hung up and I called my wife and I said, I think last stop just won the Newberry. And she said, are you sure? And I said, no, because I did, I thought it was maybe a dream um, because I was so surprised. But then it was confirmed that it really happened. And it was the most shocking part of my entire career. And I will tell you this. There are so many great books every year, and there are usually like maybe 50 that are really exceptional. And honestly, it's subjective which one is the best, right? There probably isn't a best book, but the committee that chooses the award, it could be in the case of the Newberry, it's usually 13 people, or it could be just two people on a different committee, but it's that group of people deciding what they think is the best in that moment. So, you know, you just understand that Part of it is just luck. What is your process when putting a young adult book together? Do you decide the end before the middle, or do you put it together in order? I have an idea what the end is, but every time I set out to write the book and I have my idea for what the ending is going to be, by the time I get to the ending, it always changes. So I'll tell you guys a great line. Um, This is a creative writing rule that I live by. Let's say you are writing a scene and it's in a room. Always leave a door open in that room because you never know who's gonna walk into the room. In other words, you you have a plan, right? But you also have to be flexible enough that the story might change. And that might be good for the story, so you just follow that change. What writer has had the most influence on you? I love this question. First of all, there are incredible books for young people out there right now. Um, Some of my favorite picture books I'll tell you are uh, Each Kindness by Jackie Woodson. And Jackie Woodson is one of my favorite writers. She she also wrote a book called Brown Girl Dreaming that just turned 10 years old. Um, Another picture book I love is called Watercress. That's an amazing picture book. I'm really inspired by some graphic novels like American Born Chinese by Gene Yang. Um, And then... Have you guys ever heard of a, a middle grade novel called Bud Not Buddy? It's yeah, I'm reading it right now in school. Oh my gosh, that book is so good. The voice is so good. So that's an incredible middle middle uh, grade novel. One other one I'll mention is Inside Out and Back Again by Tang Ha mm-hmm. Lai. But my favorite writer in the world, sorry to interrupt. Uh, my favorite writer in the entire world is a guy named Cormac McCarthy, and he writes adult novels, and I just think his writing is incredible, and I try to read his books all the time. Um, <clears throat> Let's just say about every year at school, I read, um, um, they read us each kindness. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. You got some good teachers, okay? <laughs> hey, can I tell you why that book is so good? Most picture books, they end on kind of a happy note or a really hopeful note. That's just the way most picture books end, right? Yeah. Each kindness ends on regret. So the character feels regret at the end. And I've never seen that before. So that's why it's so brave. 
Yeah, it's it's weird, but awesome. Yeah, I agree. You've given us some advice already. What's your best piece of advice for young writers? Okay, so this is the, the main thing I would say. First of all, read as many books as you can, because all writers, we come from the stories that come before us, right? But one other thing I'll share. If you want to be a good writer, you should speak less and listen more. Because if you are the kind of person who wants to tell stories on the page, then you should kind of collect information. Let other people talk. Listen to other people. And then when it, it comes time for you to sit down at the computer or at the table with a pad of paper, you can just let it come pouring out. So you collect as much as you can. And then when you start writing your story, you let it come pouring out. Now that you finished our middle grade novel for us, what are you writing right now? Okay, so I'm doing another picture book. Um, it's about, this is very secret, but I'll tell you guys, okay? Um, it's about a kid who every day they have to cross the Mexican border to go to school. And that's an incredibly brave thing. They have to get up at 4.30 in the morning to get to school each morning. So I I'm, I'm want, want to celebrate kids like that. So that's the story I'm working on now. Don't tell anyone. Finally, it's time for a triple 10. 10 rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Number one, what is your favorite phrase to use? I'm going to finish this up. Please feel free. Okay. What is my favorite what? Phrase to use. Uh, my favorite word is grace. Uh, my favorite phrase. Uh, let's go. That's mine. Oh, one cool. can we, by the way, can we do five rapid fires? Because I think I need to leave this classroom in a second. Okay. Okay. Number two. What is one subject you'd love to learn more about? History. Number three, what is your go-to snack food? Oh, uh, burritos. Number four, if you could have any three dinner guests, who would they be? Well, I'm going to say Cormac McCarthy because he's my favorite writer, Michael Jordan, and let's say Oprah Winfrey. Number five. What was the best piece of advice you were ever given? Hmm. Spread the tingle. Do you know what that means? If something good happens to you and you feel good, you want to spread it to other people. You were awesome. Thank you so much for doing that. Thank and you thank you so much for spending time with us. I can't wait to read your future book. Okay, bye guys. Bye, bye. Thank you.